Welcome to the Up Arrow Podcast with William Harris, featuring top business leaders sharing strategies and resources to get to the next level. Now, let's get started with the show. Hey everyone, I'm William Harris. I'm the founder and CEO of Element and the host of the Up Arrow Podcast, where I feature the best minds in e-commerce to help you scale from 10 million to 100 million and beyond as you up arrow your business and your personal life. I'm excited about the guest that I have today, Anthony Chiavarella. Anthony was previously a finance guy, went from private banking to co-founding the multi-million dollar men's underwear brand, Man Made. He's on a mission to take on the big corporations by building a brand men need and deserve. Anthony, excited to have you here. Thank you for having me, Will. I'm excited to be here. Yeah. Before we dig into the good stuff here, I do want to announce our sponsor. This episode is brought to you by Element. Element is an award-winning advertising agency optimizing e-commerce campaigns around profit. In fact, we've helped 13 of our customers get acquired with the largest one selling for nearly $800 million and one that IPO'd recently. You can learn more on our website at element.com, which is spelled E-L-U-M-Y-N-T.com. That's it. On to the good stuff. So, Anthony, men's underwear. Um, and this is really, really good men's underwear. One of the things that I liked recently is you actually had one of your uh, co-founders, I think, jump out and skydive to show how they hold up while skydiving, right? Like, what was going on with this stunt here? That was Phil. That was Phil. I was actually, um, I was actually away uh, with the family on a family trip, and uh, I knew he was going to do it. So a couple of months back, he posted something saying, "Do we want to see Phil skydive? If we do, share this video. It was a reel that we posted a couple of months ago. If we get over a hundred or one hundred and twenty shares, we're going to do it." And he ended up getting way over that. So I think nice. we set that bar pretty low, either on purpose or by mistake. We don't know. <laughs> But uh, he ended up getting it, and he's a man of his word, and that's exactly mm-hmm. what he did. So we had a nice uh, day in the month of August where he booked it, had a hard time finding a place that would uh, agree to do what we wanted to do. But uh, the place that we ended up going to um, knew who Manmade was, and they're like, yeah, for sure, we would love to. We actually have two instructors here that would be willing to do it. And uh, we sent the media team, and uh, they got it done. So Phil went 13,000 feet uh, in the sky in a propeller plane and jumped out in man-made underwear uh, 200 <laughs> kilometers an hour. And uh, if you see the clip, you'll know that uh, it went extremely well. Yeah, we'll have to link to that clip in the show notes because it's pretty funny uh, and just good to see that, you know, having good-natured fun, showing off the brand. But the, the thing that you told me that your mission is to take on, you know, the bigger change, the bigger, the bigger brands, um, why, why was it the mission? Why did you decide that this is what you needed to start? Because there wasn't, um, because they've been doing it the same old way for years and generations and whatever, you know, worked or didn't work. They didn't really care. It was just like, that's what's out there. How can we make it cheaper? How can we sell more? And, uh, we felt that we felt that, uh, when we first went on our offsite, uh, four years ago to decide that we wanted to start our own brand. And we went with a bunch of, we went there and we had a bunch of ideas we put on a whitelist and we finally went for a little walk and that was hot summer day. And, uh, we realized we all had shitty underwear. Uh, it was a funny <laughs> conversation how we got on the topic, but, uh, you know, given the two skill sets or the two things we had most in common being basically entrepreneurial spirited. And uh, having terrible underwear days, we just became extremely, extremely focused on what is out there. Mm -hmm. What are men buying? You know, are we the only guys going through this, serving, uh, ordering, trying on different products? And we realized there is not much of an option out there. And if there are, it's more on the fast fashion, probably gimmicky and not very in our opinion, uh, stand out this. It didn't really change the game in any shape, shape, way, or form. So what did, though, was the modal fabric. Once we tried on the modal fabric, we realized, wow, this is like, this is a game changer. And we realized how expensive it was compared to, let's say, the generic. And we kind of understood why. But we said to ourselves, how can we get it sold to that? How can we get the underwear to a point where it's extremely functional, has all that men want and have it in modal and not be priced at forty fifty dollars a pair. So sure. we ended up going to work and uh, we ended up getting to the point where we got to and uh, we went to market. We had a close ear to the ground. We made sure that uh, it was a good market fit. It proved our uh, our theory and uh, and the rest is history. 
what was the first year like? I'd imagine, you know, when you first launched this, uh, there's equal parts of excitement, nervousness. Is this going to work or not? You know, four months into it, six months into it, a year into it. Tell me through that journey. So they say being naive is bliss, right? It's sure. like uh, not knowing is the best sometimes because when you know too much, that's when perhaps you'll get uh, cold feet or, uh, mm-hmm. you know, obviously, <clears throat> obviously when you go, you know, four, <clears throat> four 30 year olds quitting their finance jobs, telling their wives, some of us at the time had kids, uh, which most of us, have, um, all of us, uh, one partner has one on the way, but we're all, we all have families now, but at the time telling our significant others, girlfriends or fiances or wives, uh, depending who you're talking about that we're about to quit our jobs to start a men's essentials brand. And the staple product is going to be a boxer brief only in black. It was, it was, uh, it was a shocker. It was like, what are you talking about? You know, obviously they knew that we were going to go into this completely focused and, and we're going to do our best. Um, but it was definitely a shocker. It was definitely something where it's like, are you sure? Like, are we, are we going to be okay? Um, but you had the support, uh, and we got to work and the first year was completely bananas. So if you think we roll it back, we've been around for three years live to the market, but there was a year where we were in the lab, uh, really like no one knew about it. And, uh, we were working hard. It was probably the harder, the harder year, the Mm -hmm. hardest year, you know, the, I always say the zero to one is harder than the one to a hundred. Um, and That was the year where nothing was materialized. Everything was up in here. And we are four partners and we have good ideas. And we had to get to a point where uh, everyone was aligned, which we got to. Um, But it was a year where it was during COVID. And Mm -hmm. everyone was focused about what was going on in the world. And then we just took that energy and that focus and put as much as possible into building this brand. Uh, It was a time where supply chain was a disaster. It was a time where containers were expensive. It was a time where there was a lot of unknown, uh, Mm -hmm. but we knew that eventually things were going to take the the turn for the best. Online sales, yes, they were doing really, really, really well, but we knew that things would eventually open up and it wouldn't always be the case. But given that you lock uh, the population up for X amount of years and now they're they're buying online more, that's a skill set and a convenience that you're probably not going to get rid of anytime soon. So, we we took uh we 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 got to work uh we worked that year to very pretty much build out the whole brand uh from visible non-visible elements to website to product to designing the product to figuring out because none of us have come from fashion or apparel design or anything to do with this uh so we had to we had to do a lot of our homework and that was pretty difficult uh but the passion that we had for it and the vision the excitement and the the ambition and uh, and uh, and the just pure waking up every day, like we we're gonna do this, right? It's gonna happen. Mm-hmm. It's just a question of when. And I remember we set a goal to launch May of 2021, and we were reached a point three months before because it takes about six to eight months to actually l- l- release the product, like get a get a finish mm-hmm. get a finish good into your warehouse. Uh, we knew we weren't gonna make it, and we had to extend that to August 2021. Uh, which we ended up actually receiving and launching at the end, 30th of August. Uh, but it was, it was difficult. It was difficult. It was, uh, it was a lot of discipline. It was a lot of yeah. um, making sure that everything that we set out to want to accomplish that year, that we had a game plan and we were all on the same page and uh, executing full force, like yeah. all four of us. Yeah. Um, so that was tough. That was tough. I and appreciate then, yeah. Well, I appreciate the, like you said, like the, the naivety was almost what you needed. You have to have the plan, but the plan can only go so far. It can only account for so much. And there is a little bit of like, a, you've got to go into this almost not realizing the pain that you're going to have to go through in order to do this. Otherwise, it's very hard to get started and motivated. Uh, what was your what was your go to market strategy, though? How did you get those first, you know, thousand customers? What was your plan for that? So at first, it's funny. So you think that at first, all of your family and friends, they're all going to support you and they're going to buy. And then you go from like first layer, second layer, third degree, fourth degree, fifth degree. And you're like, okay, 
This like is the amount of people. <laughs> sure. Yeah, type yeah. type of thing, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. But then we're like, okay, hold on. Uh, maybe our closest friends and family, but what about <clears throat> that's not going to be able to sell our first our first batch of underwear we received was ten thousand pairs, and we said, okay, that's not going to sell at all. So what are we going to do? So I remember at the time we made a list of well, who we're going to provide one pair, a free a free a free taste, call it. Mm-hmm. Um, and then that shifted into adding a, adding a pair to these individuals that purchase to realizing, uh, not many people that we thought were going to purchase, were going to purchase and people that were actually purchasing were people we had no idea that we're going to. Uh, so then we realized, okay, hold on, we got to deviate from this plan. And what we did was a lot of guerrilla marketing. So we did a lot of like organic stuff for sure. Like. TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, you name it, we did it. If you scroll all the way down to the original like posts, some of them are very cringeworthy, but we didn't, we didn't, sure. we took our egos and we put them aside. Like you have to put in perspective, right? We're four finance guys, CPAs, private banking, mm-hmm. wealth management, real estate. Like these are guys that, you know, suit and tie at the office. People know you, they think you're crazy for starting a brand at this part, yeah. this, you know, like, but we didn't care because we knew that one way, shape or form, we were going to figure it out. So at the beginning, it was a lot of organic. It was a lot of gorilla going out to the streets, activations, uh, having people touch the material. What are a couple of words that come to mind when you touch them? What comes of, what, what, what's the first thing that comes to your mind when you touch this material and filming it and asking them if it's okay, if we could use it for advertising and really like hustling and trying our mm. best to get the word out there organically, because we didn't have much capital to spend on ads. And in the interim, the capital that we did have, we were testing, right? We were testing to see what angles work, what videos did best, what, what's our click-through rate, what's our, what's, our, what's our conversion rate, like what's, uh, what's our cost per impression. And we're trying to figure out the formula so we can put more money behind it without bleeding out, yep. right? Yep. So uh, once we realized that this is the formula we're gonna go, go, and we're gonna go with, um, we start to scale that. But before that, I would say one of our breaks was we, a local newspaper, uh, imagine like uh, we're talking about real newspaper, like uh, the, the, the tangible <laughs> sure. ones, yeah, yeah. wrote an article about us that we hit the front page, December 8th, 2021, oh, nice. so three months after. And that's, that gave us about uh, 800 to 1,000 orders across Canada because what happened was digitally, it got picked up by the sun, like uh, the Calgary sun, the Toronto sun. All these different provinces in Canada picked it up and it became like a little bit of a viral free thing that we ended up actually getting a lot of feedback from. Um, then uh, from that, call it a thousand orders. Those are a thousand people that we did not know or they did not know us. Um, and from those thousand people, I got on the phone, my partners got on the phone. Yeah, that's good. Uh, that's wow, you're getting uh, you're getting served a nice that's, dish of that's pasta. Plenty, plenty, plenty. All right, go Thank ahead you. and give that. Thank you so much. Yeah, excuse interesting. Me. No, no problem. A little bit. There we go. All right. Thank you so much. Wow, that is. Uh... <laughs> so who's who's that? <laughs> that's my buddy Richard. I'll give him a shout out, Richard Arkel. Um. Yeah. This was obviously <laughs> staged, but do you know yeah. why? Because you and I talked about this before. I've done a bunch of random stunts on this show uh, over the years, and uh, my inspiration for it was um, Impractical Jokers. And I happen to know that, right, James Murray, one of your investors there, uh, and I, I couldn't pass up the opportunity to have some kind of a prank at least. I haven't done these in a little while, but I couldn't pass up. I have, I have picked my nose with the VP of Eddie Bauer on. I have wet my pants on an episode. I've had a lot of fun. I've tried to see how many Mean Girls quotes I could fit into uh, a podcast without somebody noticing. And so um, there's a lot of fun clips. Um, That said, yes, Richard, my buddy, just brought me some, for those who are listening, brought me some uh, soup and just continued to layer on the Parmesan cheese. That was was hilarious. I'm like, okay, maybe this is going to be, I don't know, that was really funny. So back to the important stuff, though. I I had to take away a little bit. Where, where I wanted to get with this was, I think you guys have scaled up to what, over 3,000 orders a day now, right? Uh, yeah, we're, good. we're so, yeah. So I would say about that and, uh, yeah. and, and it's going to be more during the holidays, yeah. Yeah, and so 
you know, along the road from zero to 3,000 orders a day, there's inevitably going to be hiccups. And so once you get past those first thousand customers, what were some of the things that um, crept up on you that you were like, this is, this is tough. I don't know how we're going to solve this. I don't know if we can solve this. You know, it's like, maybe this is it. Maybe this is as far as we go. Were there these hurdles or anything that you ran into along the way? Detrimental to that point, knock on wood. Ah, maybe not no. to that point, but, but no. hurdles at least, nonetheless, there, for you're like, sure. this, this sucks. For sure. Um, yeah, for sure. I would say um, we had to go through quite a bit of uh, manufacturers before finding the right one. Um, and that was, that was hard, especially, you know, we couldn't do it in Canada because we had to charge three times the price we're charging now to actually make it work. Uh, so that was really hard. Uh, and then when we found it, we were really relieved. But throughout the point of finding that manufacturer, we had to go through a couple of uh, bad batches, let's call it. Um, there were bad batches in general that we received that we had to like um, uh, get rid of uh, because we're not going to do that. And uh, yeah. it was hurtful. Um, what else? I mean, we, 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 we've been through quite a bit of obstacles. Any that come to mind where I feel like I have to throw in the towel? No, because uh, it wasn't an option. You see, sure. when, your back's, when your back's against the wall, uh, in the sense where like this is, it's either this or I got to put back the suit and tie and go back to work at the bank. Sure. Um, yeah, you, 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 you get up every single day with a sense of uh, purpose, a sense of, uh, a sense of, um, of uh, a fear, I call it, you sure. know, like uh, you, you, you just, you just want to, you just want to succeed so bad that uh, you make sure to do whatever it takes to get there. And there's no plan, you B. know, no. And I just want to clarify, you know, like some people say, I'll do whatever it takes. We've never steered in the direction of sure. doing anything that doing anything that compromised the customer, because I know this is mostly entrepreneurs listening mm -hmm. and, or, or, or aspiring entrepreneurs. But if you remember to always make the customer come first, like that is the purpose of what you're doing as a brand, you, you essentially cannot make a mistake. You see, the customer needs to be priority in all decisions that you make. And the brand is catering to the customer. At the end of the day, mm. yes, you don't have a boss, but my boss is my customer. Totally. No matter how big or how small, because if you don't think of it that way, then, then, then I believe you're probably doing it all wrong because like yeah. you're just, you know, it may be it's not a business that's going to last very long. Maybe it's, mm -hmm. you're doing it for the wrong reasons. And essentially we are building a brand, uh, for, for, for a reason to, to, to provide men, right. With quality, right. Mm -hmm. Quality basics, quality essentials. And removing that BS, removing that bullshit. So, you know, no, no bull, just basics, you know, yeah. like, just, like, just, just, just give them what they want. And, um, and that's it. That's so we're building, we're building a brand for the people. That's, that's how we it. see it. I love it. What are some of the tactics <clears throat> along the way that have proved to be the most effective for you in scaling? So, you know, you get through the guerrilla marketing and you say, okay, this is a scalable tactic. Meta. Yeah, meta ads specifically. Meta, yeah. yeah, meta, 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 meta is uh, is the reason why we were able to grow so quickly and so efficiently, a hundred percent. And I mean, now at this point, we've become part of what's called the disruptors member, mm -hmm. it's top one yep. percent of advertisers uh, in Canada, and uh, we're working very closely with our rep, and uh, she's amazing. But uh, before that, it was still meta, like it's it's measurable you're able to measure to see if the formula works and if mm -hmm. it does well you scale and then if you have the right processes in place to scale correctly right you need to make sure you have your product if you have mm -hmm. no product to sell and you're scaling and you're bleeding because now yes you're driving the traffic there's intent there's purchase there's purchasers but there's no product while well, you're throwing money in the garbage uh, so i want to stop you there because you said it's measurable yeah. And I, I think a lot of people would say that they feel like it's not. Now, I agree with you. There's a lot that you can measure there. But when you say it's measurable, 
how are you measuring the effectiveness of meta campaigns, especially, you know, post iOS 14? Like that was a tough thing for a lot of people. When you say it's measurable, what are you using? A third party tool just within platform? What does that mean to you? Yeah, we use a third party tool uh, for sure, but a lot of it is done manually. So my partner, Rob, he's the media buyer. And what we sure. do is on a daily basis, uh, we measure... We measure our cost. So we me so on a daily basis, we know, for example, uh, what's our gross uh, profit on uh, new customers in Canada, new customers in the U.S., returning customers in Canada, returning customers in the U.S., and then we have our gross profit awesome. for the day. So we know yeah. globally how we did. Uh, obviously, uh, you need to know your AOVs, your LTVs. Mm -hmm. You need to know your CPA, right? So what is it costing you to get this customer? And then if you see, okay, your three most variable costs are marketing, uh, COGS, your cost of good, and your shipping, right? So if you have those three variables and you know that you're selling for a dollar, it's costing you 40 cents to get the, to get the customer through the door, then uh, it may be costing you 10 cents to ship it. It may be costing you 20 cents to uh, get it out there. Well, 40, 10, 50, 60, 70. So you're left with 30 cents. Now with that 30 cents, you have a customer and you're able to call it, make a little bit or break even. And then you better have a goddamn good product and a good, and a, and a, and a, and a, and a, and a, a good product, good service. Some word of mouth. Yeah. Some word of mouth. Well, yeah, word of mouth and then returning customers. And then the returning mm -hmm. customers, you've already paid for the marketing on that customer. So you remove that 40 cents, call it. And, and then at that point, you're much more profitable on the second order and the third and the fourth, and then you're building a brand, right? Mm -hmm. Now there are mm -hmm. custom, there are people on this podcast that might want to sell a piece of furniture or like a game or something that you buy once. Well, your average order value is not going to be a dollar, maybe ten dollars. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? So you got to make sure that. Uh, but but your marketing might not cost you forty cents. It might cost you uh, five bucks. I don't know, mm -hmm. right? So you have mm -hmm. to you have to know, you know, what does it cost to get that customer through the door? What's it cost me to ship the customer the product? What does it cost for the product? What am I making? What are my fixed costs? What is my EBITDA? Like once you have those numbers pretty much clear, then you can measure on a day-to-day -day basis. Now is every day, every two days the same? No. Is every season the same? No. Is every quarter the same? No. But you need to make sure that you build a solid enough base of, of, of a solid enough brand that you have those returning customers or you have those customers that word of mouth is working or organic or organic mm -hmm. is to be on point, you know, like a lot of the times people, they think the marketing that we do is only on our Facebook and Instagram pages. It's not, that's organic. That yeah. has, that is not, those are not ads. Those are different to ads. That's a different day of shooting. That's more effort. All right. And we, and sometimes they get 50 likes and sometimes they get a thousand likes. Right. You know, but uh, they get the engagement, they get the views, they get the eyeballs. That's all free. And that's all stuff that people see personality, see culture, see value. You know, they see it's value for them and not just for you. And yep. before I finish, it's um, there's the there's the there's the jab and then there's the uppercut. So that's what like Gary Vee, somebody that says that a lot, you yep. know. So you want to you want to not just be giving uppercuts because that's just sell, sell, sell. You want to give those jabs, you know, you want to give mm -hmm. those jabs, those jabs is value for the customer. Once a month we do on YouTube and send to all of our customers. It's a vlog. It's a vlog for them. To keep them updated with what's going on in the life of man made and what we're doing to build it. And it's really entertaining for the people that are interested in it. People that yeah. follow us on Instagram or Facebook, it's entertaining for them. It's engaging. It's building community. And then you have the ads and the ads are a hook. A problem, a resolution, and a call to action, right? You need those four mm -hmm. elements in every ad that you mm -hmm. do. And you, uh, you need to either be educational, entertaining, um, uh, educational, entertaining, uh, and I'm missing one. But I know that those are the two pillars that we go after is basically to entertain and to educate. Because mm -hmm. people think that we're building a brand to go after or to compete against brands similar to us or call it brands that are not traditional, but that's not true. We're, 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 we're going after the traditional guys. We're going after the Fruit of Looms, the Haynes, the, mm -hmm. the, the Joe Boxers, the CKs, like the guys that are, that are, that are 
eating the majority of the pie, right? Yep. Not the slivers, the majority, because that's where people don't know any better, right? They just been buying the same boxers they've been buying since their granddad's day, you know, like it's one of those. Sure. And then they try our boxer or they try our t-shirt or they try our socks or soon our swim trunk and our pants and our crew, our crew sweater and all that. And they try it and they're like, wow, this is great. You know, and yeah. they, they, they realize the, the benefit uh, and, the, and how innovative it is because we believe that we're, we're innovating. We're not doing things the way they've always been done. You know, we push it. We push it to so the next level. You're even innovating on content. You kind of called that out that you're doing like the the uh, web log or whatever, or the video uh, that you're doing the on blog, YouTube. Yeah. yeah, I like content that is made solely for the purpose of the customer versus for the purpose of making a sale. And and all things lead towards that. But I talk a lot about um, romancing the customer and how that's a uh, you know, somebody buys something and then rather than sending them another ad immediately after they just bought something to buy something else, it's like, are you romancing them at all? Are you telling them about like why the purchase they just made is amazing? Are you taking them through this idea? Um, it sounds like you guys have thought through content a bit more meta being a big part of what you're doing. How are you approaching? And you, you talked about your four different ways that you're, you know, the four different uh, components of an ad. How are you guys approaching this? Is this a systematic thing that you're constantly coming out with? you know, a hundred new creatives a week? Is this something that you're doing in-house or you're working with the team? Like what does your content production look like? Yeah, hundred percent. We do everything in-house. We believe that uh, if you're going to do it, you have to do it yourself. Uh, you know your brand better than anybody else. I know it takes sure. a lot of resources and a lot of work, but it's one of those things for us that uh, we need to have control over because that's the lifeline. That's the juice. That's the blood that goes through the veins of the brand, right? Mm -hmm. um, so <clears throat> what are we doing? I mean, on our team right now, when we first started was an iPhone, the four of us, to be quite frank. Uh, we used to try to edit it ourselves, really not good at it. Then we got like, a subcontractor, sure. wasn't that great either. We hired our first editor, he was okay, but then realized it wasn't for him. What we needed was more than what he can actually provide. And he went to become a producer for movies and, that was a great story, but we ended up getting a really talented editor. That was the first. And then we got a videographer. And now we work with a creative director as well to bring more creative creativity, excuse me, to the, to the bunch because he's really good at what he does. He's, he's, uh, he's really creative. Um, so it's systematic for sure. Like we have uh, Wednesdays is for ads. Fridays is for organic, right? So Wednesdays we, we film ads. Uh, nice. Rob spearheads it for sure. Like we had to like make pillars on who's taking care of what and Rob spearheads mm -hmm. it, but he pulls in the partners whenever we're needed. Uh, and then on Fridays, all of us have pretty much the whole day blocked to film for organic, either morning or afternoon, depending on who's in what. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it's, it's definitely systematic. We have, uh, we have in our arsenal, like, uh, months in advance, uh, content that we're going to be pulling out. Like it's not, it used to be, um, it used to be film it today, post it today. Sure. But now, <laughs> but now, yeah. but now it's not like next week we're already filming and making content for Christmas, right? That's going to yeah. be posted around Christmas. So like you need to, you need to have that. You need to take that very seriously. Like that's, that's how, that's how your customer is going to get to know you online. You have mm -hmm. to have personality and you have to be real. And if you're not a good actor, you don't have to act be yourself. Mm -hmm. Right. And if you're not comfortable in front of the camera, get comfortable, right? We had a lot of practice on getting comfortable in front of our camera and, you know, mm -hmm. making ourselves um, vulnerable. Uh, and that's what really gets you comfortable. And then you realize that it's just uh, another day at, at another day in the office. And then you just start building and realizing what's good, what's working, what's not. Because, you know, every Thursday at three o'clock, we sit in this conference room, the whole media team, the four founders, and we take a look at all our organic and all our ads and how they're doing and what needs to be shut off and what's not and how should we do this different and where are we going on this direction? What's it looking like next month? And when are we planning this next thing? So there's a lot of planning. There's a lot of, a lot of planning and you need to be on top of it. You need mm -hmm. to be on top of it and you need to give the, you need to give the, the jabs and you need to give the uppercuts because the jabs is the value for the customers, the romancing, as you put it. And then the mm -hmm. uppercuts, 
is really the, the what's going to sell the product uh, on sponsored ads, right? And that's different. That's that's a different game. That's that's um, that that's an art. And mm-hmm. that, depending on what you're depending on what you're offering your customer, will vary. You know, a lot of other brands that uh, that sell similar products to ours are selling a lifestyle, are selling a lifestyle. It's like, uh, you know, it's uh, look like this guy or feel like this sure. or do this or that. We're like solving a problem, you know? So like uh, men have problems, we make it relatable, we make it entertaining. But at the end of the day, we don't take ourselves very seriously, but we take our product and our brand very seriously. And I think that mm-hmm. transcends pretty easily through the screen and um, and we want to continue doing that. And that's how we innovate on our marketing. I love it. Uh, and the dedication that you are putting into reviewing the creative, I think is a key part of why the creative is successful. I do see there are sometimes brands that are too hands off with that, where they say, hey, you know, you guys just go ahead and do it. Uh, they'll tell that maybe the advertising creative team is like, go ahead and just make it. And, and they're not thinking through what is working. How do you plan this in advance? And I think that those things are important to do. So good job for you on that. I want to talk about your, um, your philosophy to growth. Cause there were a couple of things that you brought up uh, when we were chatting before that I really appreciated. One of those that you said is, you know, the things that are blocking people from growing. So if, if I think about this, people are trying to get from 10 million to hundred million and they reach these different roadblocks. And a lot of times it's not even so much a, a product problem or a people problem or a process problem as much as it is maybe like a mentality problem. Um, there's something that they have to unlock within their brain uh, in a way, different way that they're thinking, like a philosophy thing. One of the things you told me is it's consistency and discipline. Every single day, day show up at the office. Um, take me through like your philosophy of growth and why consistency and discipline is so important. So we started off with four of us. Now we're closer to 30. And by the end of the year, 35. And then the end of the next year, it'll be 50. Um, wow. You're not building this alone. Mm-hmm. Right? So <clears throat> you're not building this alone. And everyone has to be on the same page. So we have a rule. It's basically like no hybrid, no work, remote work. It's like everyone at the office. It's a startup. Yes, we're out of the startup phase, but we still consider ourselves and we'll always consider ourselves a startup because you have to be, um, you have to think that way. It's like mm-hmm. in any given day, it could be Armageddon. In any given day, this can be taken stripped and away from us. Uh, mm-hmm. So that's a little bit of the mentality and the discipline uh, and the consistency. So like, uh, for example, uh, we'll be doing a town hall next Monday. Uh, not this one coming, the next one with the whole team, aligning them, what's going on with the holiday season, what's the plan for 2025, where we're going. So everyone feels like, or knows, not feels, but knows where we're headed. You know, we're a team, like from customer service to fulfillment, from pick and packer, we have like, we, 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 we explain it all because everyone's mm-hmm. a piece of that, of that vision, of that brand, of that culture. So that's the first thing. And then like, we do a lot of like offsites as the co-founders, which now we have like a director of finance, we have a director of human resources, we have director uh, in, uh, in the creative space, and we're going to be building on that. And they're going to be pulled into those. But for example, right now, every December, so after the holiday season, end of December, and every Jan, sorry, June, about twice a year, we used to go up north, we still do, and the Laurentians, we spend three days, we plan out the year in advance in December for the next year. And then in June, we revisit what we've done in the last six months and make sure we're on the right track. We have to add to that now, which every quarter, we need to do a one day offsite, just the four of us, mm-hmm. to make sure that we're not deviating or you know, is it going in the direction we said that was going three months ago or two months ago or a month ago. Because picture this, you can either be driving 50 kilometers an hour on the service road or on a road. And if you go like this with your steering wheel, it'll take some time before you go like, like before you go off road, you know, you have time to bring the steering wheel back into the middle and continue going in along your jolly way. But when you're going 200 kilometers an hour and you, and you keep your steering wheel like this for just a little bit, you're going off road like this, like yes. in a, in a, in a, in a, in a flash. So when you're going quickly and you want to grow fast, you need to make sure that you're you're continuously revisiting and aligning the team, the founders, the executive team, like everyone's beating at the same beat of the drum. Like you mm-hmm. cannot deviate from the mission. And then 
you know, you go up north, like we, we go, we do the up north thing. We plan the year in advance. We have the targets, you know, sales, product and uh, operations, social media, culture and staffing, uh, tech and finance, yada, yada. And then you have, those are the tactics. These are the goals, high level. And then at the bottom, how are we going to get to these goals? How are we going to do this? And then we, those are all the tasks. And then we mm-hmm. divide those tasks among the four of us. And then amongst the four of us, who, you know, our teams, what are they going to be doing? How are they going to get things done? And so on and so forth. Um, so that's one thing. And then the discipline, uh, sorry, the consistency, uh, showing up every day, having a morning call, the whole team, everybody, everybody mm-hmm. has one minute of airtime. What are you doing today? What's your day look like? Do you need help with anything? Okay, you know, I have uh, 15 minutes here. Let's meet in the conference room. So that's like the huddle where everyone aligns themselves every single day in order to make sure that we're going in the right direction together. We would not be able to be where we are today if it wasn't for the four of us and our teams. We always say it. Not one of us could have done this alone. And we also cannot have got to this point without our team. Everybody here wants to be here. Like, it's uh, it's a nice environment, and we want to. We just hired the director of uh, human resources. She's starting on the sixteenth. Um, I saw that post thanks. on LinkedIn when you were looking for it. Yeah, it was. Uh, it was. Uh, see, that's another. Like, I'm going to tell you something. Okay, so like every time we hire for these roles, we don't hire straight out of the gate director. We used sure. to be like, we need some help in HR. It's getting to a point it's a little crazy, you know, like. Mm-hmm. We're uh, we're trying to run this uh, this company and like uh, vacations and this and that and they and all these things, and we're like, okay, we need help. Maybe we need a HR coordinator. Go on to some, mm-hmm. uh, go into get a, get some candidates into the door. Meet with them. We find some pretty good candidates, but we're like, is that really what we need? Okay, we don't need a HR coordinator. Let's get a what are they called? Uh, yeah, HR manager. Meet mm-hmm. a couple of them. You know, okay, you have some experience, maybe two, three years, four years. And we look at each other, we're like, okay, but like, if we were to close our eyes next year, where are we going to be? And we know that answer. And we're like, okay, but this person, is a, is this person going to be that same person we're going to need next year? No. Right. Okay. You know, I need to hire five key roles right now. Five mm-hmm. really, really key roles. Are they the people? Are this the person that's going to be able to do this? Plus, plus, plus. No. Okay. So get a HR director. Yeah, it's expensive, more than the HR coordinator, but you got to invest in your people. And we're at that sure. point where we can, right? At the early days, which was not too long ago, we wouldn't be thinking like that. We try to really like run it till we can't take it anymore, till like there's blood in the fingernails. Sure. But now at this point, at this point, after a few quarters of like doing well and months and month over month doing well and going to the right direction, it's time to invest in the next you know, three, five, ten years. Mm-hmm. Um, and mm-hmm. every time we hire, we don't take it lightly. We take it very seriously. The last thing we want to do is layoffs. So, like, we make sure financially we're very stable before offering someone a type of role where they have to leave a major corporation, they have families. It's like, it's pretty serious, right? So we make sure of that. But we're at that point, and we're really proud of that. And we want to be able to hire the right people to get us to that next level. So that consistency and that discipline stays the focus. Uh, and yeah, man, it's, 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 it's really that it's like writing it down, revisiting it, making sure you're on the right path and, uh, and staying and staying the course, not getting yeah. complacent, not getting comfortable, not getting lazy. Cause it's easy, right? Like you want to get a six pack and you want to be jacked and you want to be super healthy. You get there. Mm-hmm. Now what? Now what do you do? You stay sure. there, or do you go back to your bender ways? And yeah. uh, and you know what I mean. And you got to start the cycle all over again. Once you hit what you thought was hard to hit three years ago, you just want to get bigger and better and faster and sharper. And and now you're competing in the league, right? So mm-hmm. we mm-hmm. see it like that. You know, you get to the show, which we call the show, the NHL, call it or whatever, like any professional athlete. Once you're there, you need to prove yourself and you need to stay there and get better. And if you want to be the GOAT, well, there's not many that get there, but there are. And there's some key elements that those guys all have that is, is human-like, but it's, mm-hmm. it's a life-changing. It, you have to choose. It's a path in life you have to take. Yep. You know what I mean? It doesn't come, it doesn't come without a cost. 
right? So uh, Saturday, they're in there hours, uh, hours, hours upon hours upon hours, right? It's like you know, I've I've read the stories about Kobe being in the gym, you know, before a game kind of thing. It's like he'll be in there for eight hours before the game starts or something ridiculous. It's like yeah, he's in there to win it. It's the same in business, bro. Like uh, so William, like you have to, you have to be in it to win it. Like it depends, you know, there's some people listening to this that are like, you know what? I reached 10 million, EBITDA, 2 million. I'm good. You know, maybe EBITDA to the 10, uh, 1 million. I'm good. Like I have a little business. I'm okay. Like I don't need, and there's some people that want to build like generational, like mm-hmm. businesses where it's like, you want to build something to compete because not just for the money, the money mm-hmm. will come. It's because you have something in you that is burning so strongly that it's bigger than you. It's better than you, mm-hmm. right? Um, it, it's it's stronger than you. So so either or of the spectrum is fine. But if you are going to go to the other side of the spectrum, you need to prepare to sacrifice. Uh, yep. And unfortunately, sometimes those sacrifices come with a bigger cost or like uh, relationships, uh, time with family, uh, even though we have a healthy balance, I have to say mm-hmm. we're four, we all have families. Like, you know, when we're not in the big seasons, we, we weekends are, are dedicated to our families. We try to get home uh, before supper and we put our kids to bed or whatever. We try to do all that. But when it comes to Father's Day and the holidays and if shit hits the fan, our families know. You know, this has to, this, this cannot happen. So we, we get pulled into drafting, we get drafted to war and we do what we got to do. Yeah. It's a, it's a fair way of looking at it. Uh, entrepreneur to entrepreneur. I can say that I've, I've definitely felt that myself. Uh, I wrote an article on, um, fast company years ago about how to work a hundred hours a week and not die. Um, and it wasn't hyperbole, you know, I was actually working a hundred hours a week and documenting my process of what time I start coffee, what time I'm doing creative tasks versus uh, what time I'm doing uh, logic tasks based around, you know, circadian rhythms. And it was just how I could actually function for a sustained amount of time working a hundred hours a week. Um, There's sacrifices that had to be made. Um, You'll never be able to say whether those are worth it or not, other than simply that you you have to do it. You put in the time if this is a path that you've chosen and, um, it's not easy. And, and like you said, it's not for everybody and, and that's okay. It's okay to admit if it's not for you, but if it is uh, dig in there and grind. And when you can hire those people that could take things off your plate. I like that you called out that you were hiring directors. Uh, it's some of the best advice I got uh, early on uh, was from, oh boy, I'm, I'm drawing a blank on his name right now. Um, I, it'll come to me later, but that's what he said. Uh, Justin Koffenberg. Um, that's what he told me too, was he was like, you need to hire somebody that can take it off your plate. Not just somebody that is going to manage it. You're going to manage them, but somebody that you say, this is yours. You own this. Let me know if there's anything you need from me. Otherwise you've got it. And I, I really like trying to hire from that mentality. Yeah. Uh, it's very rare. that Sometimes you'll find someone that you can mold into someone taking it off your plate completely. It's happened to me in the customer service side. Sure. I've uh, hired someone off of TikTok, believe it or not, but she was persistent wow. to get that job. And she was my first customer service while I was answering all the emails and the DMs and, and everything that has to do with customer experience off my kitchen table or at work um, two, three, four, five hours a day. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I, I trained her. She was like shoulder to shoulder to me and she learned the philosophy and how we respond to things and why the, why we, why we, why we create maybe some friction, but not too much. And, mm-hmm. um, you know, why, why we always have to do best for the customer and how to call a fraudster versus like someone who genuinely sure. uh, has an issue, how to talk to customers, all of it. And now she's spearheading that, that, uh, that division, which is rare, but yeah, uh, going forward, like it's hard, it's long. It was a long process. It was mm-hmm. like a six, mm-hmm. one year process. I can't, you can't be doing that in a, in an environment where you're growing so fast where you, you, uh, at the beginning we had no choice. I remember when I said you had to like, make sure your fingernails were bleeding before you can invest in another person. Well, that was that era. Now we're hiring for someone who could take it off our plate and do better, better than us. Mm-hmm. That's how mm-hmm. we're able to work now 40, 50, 60 yeah, hours a week cool. instead of a hundred hours a week. Right. right. Because right. I don't want to be, I don't want to be working a hundred hours a week right. forever. I don't, I don't. 
right? We don't, we all don't. We, we spoke right. about this. These are you conversations can't. with the phone. No, yeah. like uh, I, I got, I, I was in a near death experience. I've had shit happen mm. in my life where it's like, fuck, you know, like that's, yeah. that's not, that's, that's not how I want to go. If I had to go, you know, like yeah. it's, it's, I, 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 I have, I want a balanced life, even though I chose the entrepreneurial thing. But if you're building a business, how you know you're building a good business, I feel too, is that, um, is that the business will still run even if you're not in it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. In this stage of the game, it needs it. It needs us because we're not, we're nowhere near done. Like we have so many things we have to do, but. We always have it in mind that we're building a business that it needs to have its own pulse. Like it's, 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 it's capable of, Mm -hmm. this was the first year where I went away for longer than a couple of days and I checked my stuff the first week and the second week, I only took an hour a day to review everything that I missed. Yeah. It was the first time. Partially because I have partners, but partially because we have a set, we have a very good team, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. a very good team, right? And there's clear expectations from everyone, and uh, and that's important. That's important. They need to know. Mm-hmm. You can't expect people who are employed for you to know exactly what's in your brain. No, it's impossible. But you could. Uh, you could educate on what is needed to do in terms of their day-to-day task and how to go above mm-hmm. and beyond and what's expected in the next month, two, three, four, five, six, a year in order for them to know if they're doing the right, if they're working in the right way, if they're doing mm-hmm. the right things in their, in their job. So, And you can set the vision and you can set the values. And with the vision and the values mapped out, they have the ability to make some choices, say, does this align with the vision? Does this align with the values? okay, then I could probably make this decision to move in this direction. That's exactly it. That's yeah. exactly it. So you, you, you also told me, because you have a lot of wise advice here, and I appreciate this, that you are involved, uh, you and the founders are involved in a lot of D2C groups. Um, yeah. I imagine well, that you... We, uh, I want to correct that. So we're involved okay. in the sense where we, we read the content on it and uh, <laughs> okay. we follow... But uh, sure. to contribute and to post about it, uh, we yeah. feel like a lot of people that do that perhaps had exits, uh, sure. have become VCs, uh, angel investors, and they're looking for other like opportunities. We're not in that realm. So we read, we inform ourselves, especially in the earlier days. But yeah, I just wanted to correct that statement. And that's fair. Are there certain D2C groups that you would want to give a shout out that you're like, hey, if you're in a D2C space and you're trying to grow a business, this one or two are ones that I would say you, you definitely want to be a part of. Um, the one that comes to mind that I can tell you that uh, my partner, Rob, who's the media buyer of the team, Charlie, the disruptor, he's, mm-hmm. uh, he's, he's top. Uh, uh, and then I, I, would, I would just, you know, he's, he's a... Um, a lot of people know him, uh, but uh, I would say I would say Gary V. Gary V. is mm-hmm. uh, is someone in on on the on on the content side of things where uh, I would say he says a lot of wise things, which is true. We've tested the theories and they work. Yep. Um, Moise Ali on uh, mm-hmm. Moise Ali uh, is another. Uh, forget his podcast, uh, Limited Supply. Mm-hmm. Very good podcast, and of oh, course. Yeah. Yourself, William. <laughs> I appreciate that. That's uh, your checks in the mail. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, no, I appreciate that. Yeah. So um, those are those are a couple. Yeah. Yeah. When you're when you're looking at building and growing this business, aside from the things we've talked about, what else do you think is important for, let's say, a business that is at the mark? that you're at let's say that they're they're doing 10 million and they're trying to break through they or they're stuck they can't break that plateau of 10 million to get on their way towards 100 million what what other advice would you give them what other pieces do you think that they might be missing that are that are stalling their growth they're 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 getting comfortable mm. they're getting comfortable they're paying themselves good salaries they're making good money they're slowing That's down good. Uh, they're like, this is good. What I got to do more. Their why is not aligned. Mm-hmm. You know, um, why, why did you start this business? Why? 
is it for the money? Mm. Well, money's good. Yeah, but you can make money becoming an insurance broker. Like, sure. you know, why, you know, why did you, why did you, why did you start the business? You know, what's your goal? Yeah. Did you want to do, did you want to attain something outside of just, you know, sales? Cause the sales is, is great, but, uh, you know, you have to check into your why. And I would say like, uh, taking profits, mm -hmm. reinvesting into your business, scary, scary take, uh, now you're, now you're doing EBITDA where you're making, uh, two, three, four, five, six hundred thousand dollars a month or a hundred thousand dollars a month. And you have to uh, take it and re-inject it into the business where there was a once upon a time you were like, fuck, I can't wait to make that. Yeah. You know? So you're, you're why, because mm. once you know your why you're not scared anymore, mm -hmm. you know, you got your momentum, you know, your formulas, you know what you have to do. You know, you need to reinvest in your team in efficiencies. Uh, you need to invest in more product. You need to invest in talent. You need to invest in, in software. You need to invest in whatever it is. Do it, do it. You have yeah. resources now, you have resources now, right? And, and, and go to the bank now. Go to mm -hmm. the bank now. Say, hey, I did this. I did that. I need this. I need that. Even if you don't need it, you mm -hmm. always go to the bank when you don't need money. When you need sure. money, it's too late. They're not going to lend it to you. Yeah. So you, when you don't need it, you go to the bank. You show them your financials. You show them you're on the right track. You show them you have a good track record. You show them all that. You get what you need to scale because mm -hmm. it could come to a point where you're scared that if you scale, now bigger the stakes, bigger the mistakes. Mm -hmm. bigger the stakes, bigger the mistakes. You are scaling and you're spending more and you're pushing harder. One tiny mistake can cost you instead of making 600,000 a month EBITDA, you might be losing 200. Mm -hmm. How many 200s can you lose before you're bankrupt? Right. right. So, Not that many usually. Right. So, 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 so that's why. And it's like, I'm, they're scared of that. They're like, fuck, wow. They're thinking that they're at the casino. I'm being greedy. Mm -hmm. It's not greedy. You have to know your why. Why did you start this? Where do you want to go? What's your goal? That's the difference between the guy who's earlier, I said, uh, an entrepreneur that wants to reach, let's say this level. And then the guy who wants to become, who wants to go for it all. That wants, that wants yeah. the cup. That wants to be the goal. That's, that's the difference. And then, and then when you, when you come to terms with that, and you realize, okay, that's what I want to do, then go for it. You know, a lot of guys, they're like, oh, I'm going to build a business to sell it. We're not building a business to sell shit. Sure. Like, why? Just restart all over again? I know a lot of guys that sold their businesses for 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, a lot of that, a couple of guys, million, and they're 35, 40 years old, and then they're like depressed. Mm -hmm. It's a rush. To run a to run a company like this and say it's yours and every day is another is, is not the same and 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 you're you're making decisions really quickly you're using your brain a lot you're engaged mm -hmm. you're meeting people it's fun it's fun and you can't lose sight of the fun yeah once it's only about the money it sucks it you sucks. reminded me so, a lot of the poem that says uh something along the lines of you know working out is hard being out of shape is hard, choose your heart. And it goes through a series of these different things. And people have that on t-shirts and whatever now, but it's a poem and I don't remember who wrote it. I should know, but it's uh, the idea of people getting comfortable. I think the, the point is you have to get comfortable with the uncomfortable, right? So you have to be comfortable with working out. You have to be comfortable with choosing hard things each day. And if that's what you're comfortable in, then it works out. But if you're just getting comfortable and like you said, uh, getting lazy with the approach to growth, it, it, you are limiting yourself because you're limiting your, your why you're limiting where you're going with that. Look, if you're profitable and you're at 10 million and you're profitable and you're doing well and like, it's going well, good for you. Like you're part of that small percentage of companies that are able to do it. But if you were able to get to that point, what's stopping you to get to the other point? Sure. Like stop putting limited, like stop limiting your belief. Stop, stop putting limits to your growth. Mm -hmm. Just, just, you know, cross your T's, measure your eyes, have a plan, stick to it. The same formulas that worked for you in the past will work for you fundamentally for the future. It's, it's the values of how you do things that get it done. It's yeah. not, 
anything specific. You asked me before, you know, what did you do that was, there's not one thing that we did that, oh my God, it changed things for us. It's a, it's a, it's an accumulation of many little things that exactly. became this big thing. We're four guys from a small town, well, small town, from the city, but from a small section in, in east side of Montreal who went to public schools. I never finished university. I have five wow. classes left, right? I never finished because I started my business, right? Sure. I was doing it part-time. Why? I was doing it part I had all these certificates and uh, licenses to, uh, to work in the finance world. And I was getting my university degree part-time while being at the bank that I met when I left the bank, I put everything on pause sure. and I learned more in business than I would have ever learned totally. in school where now the universities are calling us to go present on our business. Sure. So like at the end of the day, I am not the smartest guy. Rob is not the smartest. Phil is not the smart. There is not, nobody's the smartest guy. Sure. But when you have a plan and you're consistent and you're disciplined, then you build it properly. It will come. Anybody, anybody can do it. Literally mm -hmm. anybody can do it. It's just how badly do you want it? So that's where that why comes into factor. That's where, and even us, every couple of months, we have to revisit that and, and, yeah. um, and uh, make sure we're on the same trajectory and make sure that uh, we're, we're all, we're all aligned because we're human beings at the end of the day. Like, oh. uh, you know, I can, I can, I can, you know, some shit can drop on your lap tomorrow that will fuck you up. That will fuck you up mentally. And it takes, takes courage and discipline mm -hmm. and, and a lot out of you to stay focused. Right. But you yep. do it. And then once you get through it, it builds you. Right. So, totally. so, so that's it. That's, that's, how that's I, a, there's no secret sauce. Well, I mean, you're right. There isn't, but there is, that is the secret sauce. And if people get that, then they can, you know, hustle and work and grind and stay disciplined and consistent. Um, and I think that's a good transition into who is Anthony Chiavarella, because you're kind of getting to this. One of the things that you told me about is uh, growing up, you oldest of three kind of had this gift from God to be able to read people. Um, obviously you have uh, something in you that makes you disciplined and inconsistent. Uh, tell me a little bit about your childhood and how you think that has helped shape you to be who you are. Um, yeah, I'm the, I'm the oldest of three. I come from, a. my mom was a homemaker. Uh, my dad worked uh, in construction. Um, I have a brother that's three years and a half younger than me and a sister that's six years younger than me. Um, um, I always got like uh, support from my parents. Um, I always got support from my parents. But when I started working at the bank, at the, such a young age, I started working at the bank. I was actually 17 when they hired me. I was turning 18 in a couple of months, two, two months. And uh, they made a mistake. They didn't realize I wasn't 18 yet. So I started working and when they had to give me my first pay, they're like, hold on, you're still not 18 yet. And I'm like, no, and they're like, okay, whatever. We'll pretend that we didn't see this. Sure. And then two months passed. Yeah, it was pretty crazy. But I, I learned a lot. So yeah. I learned a lot with customers, working as a teller and in the office as a mm -hmm. financial advisor. And I worked my way up. And what was the best part was sitting down with a customer who was broke, a customer who had money, a customer who did well who didn't do well. And I wouldn't focus mm -hmm. on what they do for a living because there was different people in different strokes of life that did well that you were like oh my god how, like, how did you do this being this and then there was people that are like doctors and lawyers that were broke sure. right so just to give you perspective um and i would always ask and go under the layer like what did you do like what walk me through your life like i would sometimes during these meetings block like an hour and a half an hour 45 minutes was talking about them and asking them questions of who they are and uh, I was always fascinated about learning about people and how they, what made them tick and what were the little differentiators that made them successful. A little bit about like this podcast, you know, like uh, mm -hmm. you're asking me all these questions full circle. And uh, I learned a lot about uh, myself uh, through these people, because a lot of the people that were saying things like, 
well, you know, I have to do this and I have to do that. And I came from this and I came from that. And I'm like, oh, did you have backing capital? No, this is how I did it. Or this is what I did. Um, I realized that uh, it took just to want it bad enough. And I, and I did. And I, and, I, and I always wanted something more. I always had this voice inside of me saying like, mm-hmm. is, this, is this it? Get up every morning, go to work, play the game, come back home. Like, is this, is this it? You know, this is what I'm going to be doing. That's why it took me so long to finish university. I never knew what I wanted to do. I knew I liked business. I knew I liked finance. But to say that I wanted to become a CPA or a banker for life, I wasn't convinced. So um, I met a customer and uh, this customer enlightened me because he too had very similar, in private banking, had similar uh, traits than I did. And uh, he was jolly and he was, uh, he was uh, well-to-do. And he kind of told me like, you don't have to follow the lay of the land. You don't have to follow what society paints you for. Because I never had, like my mom being a homemaker, my dad being construction, someone saying, did you do your homework? Did you make sure of this? I never had that hand held, that hand holding. They made sure to have a roof over my head and a food on my, in my belly and love in my heart, but never to the point mm. where they were able to say, this is the path you need to go into. We're going to put you to the best schools, da, 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 da. all that stuff that never happened. I had to do it myself. So yeah. I think that's what, um, that's what maybe got me to learn a lot more about myself and having to go and strive for things myself uh, never made me take things for granted. And when I met this customer, uh, he, he really pushed me to, to leave the bank, to be honest. Um, yeah. He's like, what are you scared of? <laughs> that bank job is going to be there. If you have 10 years, 20, like you're a smart guy, like you're going to, you're going to get another, the other banks. There's, they, they'll hire you yeah. back. These guys paid you for 12 years. They've trained you, you know, the culture, you know, everything. If you ever want to come back, the door is always open. This bank is not going anywhere. Yeah. So he enlightened me and my parents pushed me. My dad He's like, yeah, he's like, this is the most time, like, like, this is your chance. Like, if you're going to take a risk, do it now. I love that. So, uh, so yeah, so uh, I'm a guy who didn't know what the hell he wanted to do in life, uh, but, um, but uh, knew he liked, uh, knew he liked uh, people, service. I was an extrovert. I still am. I like, um, I like, uh, I like working hard and working with good teams. Um, I like striving for better. I like yeah. sports. I love my family. I love my kids. Um, these are yeah, all good I love things. my team. Yeah. So that's, yeah. Uh, these are things that uh, there's a little bit about me. Yeah. It, it, it's helped shape you. Um, I know James Murray is one of your investors. Is it all of the... Uh, he's, not an, he's not an investor. Not an investor, investor. Or, or he's just he's just he's, like uh, an advertiser or, or uh, an influencer, an ambassador. There yeah. you go. That's the word I'm looking for. Okay, so so he's he's one of the ambassadors. Do you work with all of them or just him? Just James Murray? Just him. Just him. It, is he as silly? Like, have you met with him? Is he as silly in real life as he is in the show? He's the same. <laughs> That's pretty good. They, there's no uh, there's no show. James it's not a character. In real life. No, yeah. it's him, and that's that what's really Jay. cool about those guys. They uh, they're four best friends as well. Yeah, and uh, that's what's really cool about them, and what resonated with us is uh, we see that we're we're kind of cut from the same cloth, you know. Yeah. So that uh, that really uh, attracted us to to them, and vice versa. And uh, we're working closer with James. He really loves our brand, loves our products, loves what we stand for, and you'll be seeing a lot more content. Uh, from awesome. James in the upcoming months. Yeah, it's uh, him, Howie, and we have some yeah, really right. cool people Howie lined Mandel. up for the future. Yeah, Howie Mandel yeah. is really nice, by the way. Just shout out to Howie. That guy is uh, heart of gold. Uh, he, he reached out to us. Like, I reached out to him, but his people never got my email. And then randomly on a Saturday, I see a comment on one of our ads saying, thanks to the guys up north for taking care of my boys down south. And then we got on a call. Wow. I DM'd him. He DM'd me back. I got on a call. I said, yeah, I reached out to you guys. He's like, I never saw your email. I got to talk to my team, whatever, whatever. And he's like, look, I really like that you guys are from Canada. He's like, yeah, I, like you, I like you guys, I like your products. He's like, uh, anything I can do to help. So for a couple awesome. of weeks, months, 
everything was done organically from him. And now we have something where we're a little bit more on the, on a structure and more long term. But the deal with him is I don't give no – with everybody, all of our – no scripts. I don't tell you what to say. Sure. I don't want to – it's 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 it speaks it's in the only heart. way it can be done. Yeah. 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 Because so. that's the only time when you come up with really good lines like, thanks to the boys up north for taking care of the boys down south, right? <laughs> that's because it's him. It's unscripted. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Exactly. So that's, that's, so good. that's it, man. What, uh, what are some quotes that you live by? I know we've talked about a couple of quotes. Uh, there's a mug that you had. What's a quote that you live by? So yeah, that mug was, uh, nobody cares, work harder. Yeah. And who said That's that? That's the mug. Uh, the, the actual person who said it, I don't, uh, I can't quote him. I, I don't know. I'm sorry about that. Oh, I thought but, it was uh, you. I thought that was your quote. <laughs> it, perhaps, but I, I received, I, I, I so I, it may be, but I, I, I'm pretty sure if you Google it, somebody said it. Sure. But the point is, is, um, I had a mug, uh, back, uh, back at the bank. I remember there was uh, some sort of altercation. I was working really hard. I was making sales. I was doing everything well. And I wanted something and I didn't get it. And uh, I kind of said, like, I'm the like, number one performer in this, in, this, in this department. Like, I don't get why I can't get this little, like, shouldn't I have a bit of, bit of preferential treatment? It's not a bit. Like, I'm not even asking for anything sure. crazy. I don't get what. Well, if you know, if I do it for you, Anthony, I'll do it for everybody else. So I realized then and there, I'm like, okay, nobody cares. Just work harder. And then mm-hmm. don't do it for them, do it for you. Uh, and that's when that bit of that toxic uh, corporate thing got into me. And I, I think that was the start of like why I wanted to start my own thing. And when I did, I wanted to make sure that the culture uh, of whatever, whatever we start isn't that. Yeah. It's uh, work hard. Everybody cares, you know, like mm. that thing. Uh, so, so, so that was a bit uh, of a full circle, but another one that I live by is uh, you miss a hundred percent of the shots you don't take. And that's from Wayne Gretzky. Mm-hmm. And I love that quote because, uh, going back to what you were saying before, you know, how do you get people from moving 10 to a hundred or one to zero or whatever? Uh, you have to take the shots. You, yeah. you have one life, bro. Uh, William, you have one life, yep. you know, um, and, uh, when you're old, uh, 90, 100, and hopefully we live to 120, 130. Yeah. And uh, you're talking to your grandkids, great grandkids, and, uh, you know, uh, you have wisdom. Yeah. And uh, you're sometimes maybe too old at that point to start something or have the energy to do something or the health to do something mm-hmm. at that point. So the last thing you want to do is uh, regret, feel regret saying, fuck, I should have done it like this. And I didn't, mm-hmm. uh, why, why did I, you know, why did I not do it? You know, and feel that, and that for me is, is worse than trying and failing. Totally. Right. That's from, so if that's the case for anybody listening, if feeling regret is a shittier feeling than trying and failing, at least you tried. And if somebody said, yep. ah, bro, remember that time you started that business and you failed? Yeah. At least I tried. Yeah. You know, and I the people remember, that are telling you that are just jealous people. Totally. When my daughter was younger, I don't remember my, it was my oldest daughter. Maybe she was in second grade or something. I remember her being afraid to try something. And I don't remember what it was she was afraid to try, but she was afraid of failing it. So not afraid of trying, afraid of failing. Right. Um, and I remember cr- crinkling up some uh, balls of paper and I set up like a little bucket or a bowl or something over there. I said, okay, you go ahead and shoot and see if you make it. And you know, she shot and maybe she made that one. And it's like, and I was like, I don't know. I'm not going to shoot it. I don't want to miss it. So I'm not going to shoot mine. You go ahead and shoot again, right? So she shoots and misses it. And like we go through this several times. I'm like, well, you know, you made yours. I don't want to miss after you made it. Why don't you just go and shoot again? So we keep going through this. And, you know, at the end of like 10, 10 shots or something, it's like, okay, let's see who won. And it's like, how many, how many did you score? And she's like, I got three, right? Three out of 10 or something. Like, right, how many did I get? She was like, well, you never shot. And I was like, oh, yeah, you're right. So I don't, I don't have any points. Like, I didn't get anything because I didn't even try. I didn't even play. Yeah, you missed seven, but you made three. And so three is still more than zero, right? And she's like, yeah, okay, I got it. And it was like a really good practical way of showing that. that it, it's a great quote by Wayne Gretzky. I love it. I can't wait till my boys are uh, twin boys. They're 10 months old. Uh, and I can't wait till they get old enough to... Um, to, uh, to experience those things with them. And uh, one thing that I've always said I would love to do is like, 
you know, come to any job, I want to do lemonade stand, or maybe I can go cut some grass or whatever the case is. Mm-hmm. And just like, um, and just, and just, uh, seeing them do it and, and, um, uh, and helping them like, uh, mm-hmm. helping them where, helping them where they may be a little bit confused and maybe, you know, making them make the decisions and realizing on their own where maybe it would have been a bit different and teaching them less about how to do it right, but the perseverance and the discipline and the consistency you would need in order for you to succeed. And once you do, how much sweeter it tastes rather than being given, given yeah. the, the sauce, you know? Well, now you have a podcast to show them when they're older, all about discipline and <laughs> consistency. Um, Speaking of discipline and consistency, or let's just say taking shots, are there things in your personal life that you're also trying to up arrow that you're consciously trying to improve that's not business related? Maybe it's health, sleep, relationships, whatever. Are there certain areas that you're trying to improve on personally? Um, so I was 270 pounds once upon my life. I was always very athletic. I was always extremely uh, into sports, soccer per se training three, four days a week. Uh, at one point in my life, I was 270 and then I became 180. I had a full wow. 360. I, I dropped the weight. I got really ripped. I, I, uh, I was really healthy. And now I would say I'm uh, hovering between 210 to 20, but I am consistent. Like every day like I used to, before the kids, I used to train at a gym locally here privately with a trainer and I would like go hard. Like some people wouldn't be able to last a 45 hour sure. of training, but I consistently stayed on the, the train, even when I was sleeping two hours a night, like it was cr- pretty crazy, <laughs> but I didn't, ne- I never wanted to get, I never wanted to go more than a couple of days without getting on a bike or running or anything for 30, 45 minutes. Because then what happens is you create the habit of not wow. doing it. And then it's harder to get back onto the train. So, um, so I have that down packed. but when it comes to nutrition, I eat well, in the sense where I don't eat McDonald's and all that stuff, sure. but I eat maybe sometimes too much, you know, like man, so man, so have, you got right? yeah, that's a, yeah, yeah. I'll have that I got a grandma. Of, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I have that yeah. extra piece of bread. I'll have, uh, I'll have, uh, this or that and all that stuff. Also nicotine. I don't smoke cigarettes, but I'm on the uh, nicotine replacements. Um, I've been on it since I quit and I've quit smoking. Congrats. Five years ago, like four years ago, I don't really remember deal. how long it's been. Yeah, the smoking part, but the nicotine mm-hmm. part, that's a different, there's, that's a different thing. And I kind of convinced myself at some point that nicotine is also good for your brain health and this and that in small doses, but, um, it does, it does, does do something. I know it does, but, uh, but definitely being dependent on something, uh, like nicotine sucks. So that's something sure. I want to, I want to correct. And, um, biting my nails, I bite my nails a lot. <laughs> That's another thing that I want to, want to correct. Um, I've gotten better with it, but, uh, being like emotionally call it intelligent or having an emotionally intelligent uh, IQ, totally. uh, it also causes the reverse effect sometimes of maybe showing too much emotion in the bad, in, 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 uh, in certain settings where, uh, I've gotten much better with time, but obviously there's always a better, you can always get even better, you know? So that's something that, uh, that I want to, I want to correct. I would say I'm very empathetic in terms of, uh, any scenario that's put in front of me. Uh, hence why I'm in uh, the leader of, uh, the customer experience side of things. And I've always done really good with that, but, um, but yeah, like, uh, what else? There's a lot no, of those are, things. That's yeah, yeah that's a lot of stuff. Uh, you, you've got a list of things and a list of goals that you're trying to be conscious about improving. I love that. I think that that's, that's just the mind of somebody who is an entrepreneur as well, because you're constantly seeing things that have the opportunity to be improved. Um, I have to ask, you mentioned a near-death experience. Is that what caused the shift from 270 to 180? Or No. The near-death experience was on my honeymoon. Uh, we're supposed to go to Bali and, um, we stopped in Qatar, um, and in Qatar, we're at a hotel and we had one day that we had to sleep there. And the next morning, our flight was only at 4 PM. So we had some time to do a bit of the school, explore a little bit of Qatar. And I did a excursion in the sand dunes. Uh, and we had a really cool. bad accident where the car ended up flipping over, uh, 12 times. 
and being stuck in the middle of the desert for three hours wow. with my wow. uh, new my uh, my wife uh, that we just got married like two days ago, the two days uh, uh, before the accident happened. Uh, helicopter to the to the hospital. I had uh, bruises and stuff, but nothing broke, nothing severe. My wife, on the other hand, uh, she had a hip surgery, two mm. fractures, three fractures on her back. After five years, it's going to be our five-year anniversary this 26th of October. After five years of osteo and the operation and treatment and so on and so forth, she's doing uh, well. Uh, obviously, there's always going to be, uh, you know, uh, bones, once they break, it's uh, never mm -hmm. the same. But, uh, but, uh, but uh, we have kids, uh, you know, like uh, she, she's a tough, tough cookie. Right, so okay. tough cookie, and how does that change? change there. Right, like how uh, does that near death? What goes on now? Yeah, you, um, you, you, you appreciate every day that mm -hmm. passes, every single day. Uh, I started to pray, so every morning, every night, a little prayer. Call it spirituality. Call it whatever you want to call it, but it's prayer. Uh, to say that I'm the most religious before that i wasn't to say that i thank god i do to say that um i realize that life today you're on today you're doing well today everything is going well and in a in a in a blink of an eye you could uh things can happen um but i remember that once that did happen um and i survived it and and, mm -hmm. and we persevered through it uh, it was one of the one of the harder things that I've been through. And I would say I realized like life throws you lemons, make lemonade. You know, like uh, mm -hmm. there's there's no other ways of putting it. Like if something happens in your life, and at the time we were building the business, like at the time we were we were, I was I was I was I was in the entrepreneurial world. You know, so um, it was tough. It was tough. It was really tough, and you have to, you have to, you have to, you have to pull through. Another thing that happened before I had my twins at eight months, my wife was pregnant with her first son, and he was a stillbirth. So we lost mm. our first boy. Yeah, uh, Luciano. We named uh, Giordano. His middle name is Luciano, and Leo's middle name. Those are my twins. We gave them both the middle name of Luciano. But that was another one. That was another mm. very, very, very still is hard part of life that uh, could have easily uh, steered uh, my direction, but, uh, but it didn't, not because I didn't put focus on processing what happened, but more because um, I understood the why of my company and, and, and once you go through things like that, um, it changes you. Mm -hmm. But it could change you for the better, or it could change you for the worse. Um, totally. And uh, yeah, and you realize how precious life is, and you realize how lucky uh, you are, and you realize um, to not take to not take anything for granted. Right. So these mm -hmm. are things that uh, these are things that I've learned throughout the the last couple of years. And I still have a lot more learning to do. That's for sure. That's a good thing, right? We want things to learn. Um, man, I can really sympathize with you on the miscarriage though, too. Um, I'm sorry to hear that my wife and I, we had two miscarriages in between our first and our second. And uh, there was a time where we weren't sure we were going to be able to have another child there after the second one. And it was, you know, it was a really bad one. And, uh, you know, like How you many said, months thankful. Was she you know, I think it was about three months uh, without going into too much details. I mean, her, her hemoglobin was under six. I mean, she had bled out so much that uh, it was dangerous for her. And so it was uh, it's a big deal where we were just like, you know, this isn't for us. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. Um, aside from the emotional side of it, there's just uh, there's a lot there. But so, you know, it's one of those things where I think uh, to your point, you're grateful for every blessing that comes as a result that you see all the things that are in your current life that are blessings that you maybe took for granted. Uh, and I think that's important. hundred percent. I feel like, uh, once like when I went through the stillbirth scenario with my son, a situation, excuse me, with my son, um, and you talk about it, you get the courage to eventually talk about it. 
more and more people talk about their journey and their stories. Mm -hmm. and, um, mm -hmm. Back to full circle from the beginning of our conversation where when you're naive, it's, it's sometimes mm -hmm. better. So many people are pregnant and things go well. And I, I, that's all you, that's all you want, right? Healthy babies and good pregnancies. Right. Um, and that goes really well and that's their experience and that's great. But uh, more and more and more uh, you hear about these miscarriages, stillbirths, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. you know, all kinds of stories. And, um, and that's hard. Mm -hmm. It's probably the hardest thing. That's the hardest thing I went through in my life. Uh, so, so, so when you said before any obstacles, there wasn't like a production run or a marketing campaign or anything particularly in the business that almost made me throw in the towel. No, and not, not all of us. Well, when that happened, I, I, I was like out of it for maybe, you know, a couple of weeks and my, my wife months and a year, a year almost. Um, so, so. So having good partners, um, mm -hmm. and I remember like getting my mind to help me to help me when my wife would be resting or whatever. My computer was open, you know, staying in, you know, feeding off the energy of of the brand that you built sometimes mm -hmm. helps, you know. So totally. so that was that was super therapeutic for me. Um, and yeah, that's a little bit about uh, who Anthony is and what he's been through. I love that. There's so much that you shared there. I really appreciate um, how raw and real that was. It's good to get to know you. Um, you've shared a lot of really good wisdom and advice for people that are building their business as well. And I appreciate that. I'm just thankful for your time uh, coming on here and uh, talking to us and sharing your knowledge and wisdom with us, man. Thank you, William. And I just want to point out, I don't, uh, I saw those things that I shared, you asked me for sure, but I, I share them. Uh, I share them to whoever asks uh, for sure. And I don't share them for like, obviously it's, it's, it's sad and uh, right. it's soft for pity or it's like, oh my God, it's more for anybody listening. I know that there's, there's people that go through fucking rough shit in their life. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Like, Mm -hmm. uh, it's not pretty and it's not fun and it's not, uh, it's an uncalled for, it's uncontrollable. It's out of your control. That's what I want to say. It's out of your control. Mm -hmm. Um, you can get Robert De Niro said this one. So here's another quote that I like before I let you go is you can get too, you can get too happy. Not, not happy, not the right word. I forget the quote, but you can get too high when times are good and you can get too low when times are bad, you just have to try to find that, that, that medium, you know, that, 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 mm -hmm. that point where you, you remain calm, you're allowed to celebrate and you're allowed to, you know, uh, enjoy the milestones that you hit and things that go through in your life. But, uh, but then back to business or then back to the focus of, of what, of what your why is right. Mm -hmm. And, uh, same thing for the lows, you know, you process this, like the worst thing to do is to, throw anything you go through in life under the rug. Okay. Because it's going to haunt you and it's going to haunt you and keep haunting you process it, talk about it with the right people, uh, get help, uh, take the mm -hmm. time you need in order for you to get better. Sometimes working on yourself, doing things that make you happy, make you feel accomplished, make you feel worthy, whatever those help. But, um, but yeah, don't get too low when those times happen because it can really, you know, it can really affect, someone's life and uh, having a good support system, like a very good support system, maybe a friend, maybe a neighbor, a partner, a wife, a mm -hmm. girlfriend, whatever. There's having someone there that you trust that you can, uh, you can lean on when times are bad uh, and be there for people that are going through things like that when times are bad for them is important. And, and, and you can't lose sight of that in life. I think that's important even for entrepreneurs, all right. We want to be these tough guys that uh, are fucking Teflon and uh, big bad this and that. You're a human being, bro. There's always something that can fucking get to you that creeps up so bad that you don't even know what hit you. But mm -hmm. uh, you're also human and, you know, uh, pain will diminish through time, no matter how hard the pain is. It'll never go away completely. It'll go. It'll be it'll be it, the, the light will dimmer. And, uh, as long as when that light is dim, you, uh, you are at peace with, uh, with that pain, uh, you will go, you will get through anything uh, that comes your way. So I think, I think that's a good piece that I wanted to leave you with because 
anybody listening that's going through something and it brings any any uh, 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 any any value to that and it helps anybody is is worth more than this whole podcast that we've done in the last hour and a half for me you know like that's something that's mm-hmm. that's uh, i hope someone uh, takes uh, takes with them if they need it beautiful advice to end on Anthony, thank thank you you so much for joining us. And everyone, thank you for listening. I hope you all have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you, William. It was a pleasure. Thanks for listening to the Up Arrow podcast with William Harris. We'll see you again next time. And be sure to click subscribe to get future episodes.